potential. Today I have with me in the studio one of Southwest Georgia's pillars uh, within this community, uh, just has been very steadfast and always forthright in his uh, desire to see uh, an improved community, uh, but while uh, simultaneously educating us on our, on our past, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, but nonetheless uh, always reminding us that it is a, a part of our foundation and having a full understanding will certainly certainly help us to make the strides and gains that we need. I could go on and on about him, but you will certainly recognize his very familiar face. Hello, how are you, Mr. Frank Wilson? Well, how are you, Wendy? I'm fine, <laughs> thank you. I'm fi it has been quite a while since yeah, we've been. had you in the studio. It has been. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to uh, change that. <laughs> You always have a wealth of knowledge uh, to provide, um, uh, sometimes very sobering information, but nonetheless uh, needed and always timely and very relevant. And so you are, uh, again, I say this um, with the utmost of sincerity, I'm, I'm always in awe of your, your passion and the consistency uh, of it. And I'm, I have no doubt that you, I'm sure, have been extended invitations uh, from across the country to serve in some capacity of um, being the true educator that you are. But uh, fortunately, you stay in Southwest Georgia, keep us on our toes and, and remind us of our history. Tell, us, tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, your educational pursuits. I know it's just one or two people out there who do not know, but let, let's, <laughs> they just arrived in the community. So let, let's yeah. educate those one or two people about well, uh, your background, uh, educational and your career path. Well, um, born and raised in Moultrie, mm -hmm. went on to uh, Fort Valley and uh, got an undergraduate degree. Um, got a master's from uh, Southfield University, but uh, spent most of uh, my career and uh, between education and community service, uh, first uh, in the classroom as a history teacher, then with the Urban League, uh, with Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and back here in Albany uh, with the Chamber of Commerce, here at Albany State with, with Cam, and just kind of uh, spent 42 years doing those kind of things and, and trying to make sure that I gave back uh, to those behind me as much as was given to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now, um, fortunately, we, we still have you and you avail yourself in so many different arenas, but now your day, your day job, what, what you doing, <laughs> what's, what's the day gig look like for, for you? For the last four years, I've uh, been, had, had the pleasure of being the executive director of the Albany Civil Rights Institute. Yes. And uh, it's one of those jobs that really, if I could afford it, I'd do it for free. Mm. I enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, I understand how the Civil Rights Institute connects the dots for not only our community, but for Southwest Georgia and really for the world. Because uh, so much misinformation gets out. Sure. Uh, and then there's always that lack of information that concerns me the most mm -hmm. that, uh, we don't know our history. And, and it has been said, if you don't know your history, it's you bound to repeat itself. Repeat it. And yes. so uh, I take pleasure in, in trying to make sure that we connect the dots, especially for our young folks. Sure. Um, so two questions. What has been, since you've been serving in this role, what has been uh, the, the most rewarding moment and also, what has been the most disappointing moment? Those are very easy. Okay. The most rewarding is to, is to get the news that Albany Civil Rights Institute and the Shallow Baptist Church have been added to uh, the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Yes. 
that's that's a big plus for Albany uh, in many ways. Um, it puts us on the map right there with the Lorraine Hotel, mm. with the uh, with the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge, yes. um, and it it brings to brings the world to Albany, which is an economic development piece for us because when we bring tours into Albany, there's heads and beds and feet on the street and the grocery stores mm -hmm. and gas stations benefits from from that so we're excited about being sure. that part the most disappointing has been to find out how many people don't even know we have a civil rights institute here in Albany and so that's why uh, I spend almost every day doing something that makes the community aware and I think the very the very low point was to have an educator mm. to deliver a package to me sent by a mutual friend and to say to me, oh, I've never been in here before. Mm. And, and, I, and I'm, my, my concern is that you cannot leave where you've not been. Right, right, yeah. Um, and so, again, I used the word sobering earlier and I'm sure that was a very sobering moment for very you. Very so. Um, you being an educator yourself, um, and then in many respects, this is still a very small community. So then you begin to question, so where have we, and I say we, where have we dropped the ball um, that we are not um, interconnected in a way that we, we should be? Um, this is, um, again, as you, you use the adage about if we don't know our history, we are doomed or destined to, to repeat it. Um, and we were seeing that play, play out. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, in um, minute by minute. Um, and so, if, again, if we are not more intentional with engaging one another and uh, coming to a collective understanding that what Frank Wilson does directly impacts Wendy Wilson in terms of the organizations that we respectively uh, represent. And so your success is my success and vice versa. And so. I, as much as we think that we do a good job with that, we, we, drop, we drop the ball. I, I, think the, I think the most important thing that we, we've been able to do and continue to build upon is to really reach outside of ourselves. Yes. Uh, we, 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 every opportunity I find to, to have a joint program with another organization it, it adds one more friend, it adds some more knowledge, it brings the members of that organization to our facility, or it, it takes our membership to their facility, and so it spreads it around a little bit. Um, I can think of nothing better than uh, the last couple of years, um, the Museum of Art has partnered with us in presenting the Black History Choir. Okay. Um, um, and also, we've partnered with them in bringing to the city uh, courageous conversations about race. Mm -hmm. And so it's being able to move outside ourselves n to, to spread that tent real wide so that everybody com becomes comfortable standing under that tent that the Civil Rights Institute is not a black institution, it's a community institution Indeed. that educates not only about what happened here in the 60s, but also what's happening now. Sure. Because there are so many things that, that our community needs to know. A couple of weeks ago, I had a community night on the Camilla Massacre. Mm. This happened, uh, we'll celebrate 150 years, celebrate may be a bad word, commemorate 150 years on September 19th. Mm -hmm. There were folk in Albany and many in Camilla who had never heard of the Camilla Massacre. Hmm. And and simply put, it was an event that shaped yeah. Southwest Georgia in many ways because among one of the people that were wounded in that particular massacre was Francis Flagg Putney, hmm. who later founded Phoebe Putney Hospital and named it for his mom. Mother, yeah. And so it's it's that kind of history that people some people don't want to know. Right. Others just don't know. And there are others who rather not know. Sure. But the fact that it's a, see the thing about history, it took place where it took place. Mm. It took place when it took place. You can't go back and erase that history. 
And it, it's important that you know it because it becomes a part of shaping your community. It becomes a part of shaping who we all are and how I often, I often say <laughs> between the civil war and civil rights, everybody will have an opinion about it. <laughs> Indeed. It, was, it shaped us in one way or the other. But that history is what it is, where it is, and how it is, and we have to report it, whether or not we like it or not. Indeed, I do. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's a lot, and, and most people, um, and depending upon the person that you're having the conversation with, um, choose not to discuss it because of, uh, based upon uh, who the hitch history is directly attached to, um, it can be very painful, and it is very painful, so then there's that just, let me, I don't want to relive that. Uh, but we do a disservice, particularly if you were, um, have direct knowledge of it, when we do not educate others. Um, because again, so many things are happening in real time um, yes. that are reminiscent of that past. So that, that uh, past or that history lesson, if you will, provides us with the blueprint. So we'll be able to recognize it when we see it and be better equipped, if you will, in terms of how to address and respond to it. I, I think it's important. You said something, you touched on something, is how to respond to it. Mm -hmm. You see, <clears throat> a lot of things we see now, we've seen before. Sure, <laughs> sure. It, it, it's sure. nothing new. Yes. Uh, the point is, however, I think we should now be in a, at a place where we can deal with it a lot differently. Yes. Um, this program that I mentioned er earlier, uh, Courageous Conversations About Race, Yes. it puts young folk in particular and some older folk who would attend it in a position to say it's okay to talk about race. Mm -hmm. It's okay to have certain feelings around race. But it's not okay to hold it in. Let's talk about it. Let's get it on the table so that we can begin to resolve the problems. Mm -hmm. Now, well, this is this 100% foolproof? No, there are some folks not going to change. Right. Period. I don't care what facts you present them. They're going to. I mean, don't confuse them with facts. Right. Gonna, <laughs> <laughs> don't confuse them with facts. But I think when you have folk who are willing to sit down and admit, I have this problem. So how do we now talk about this and begin to see why is there a problem to me and be, be able to become comfortable with each other? Uh, I mean, nobody's gonna come out of this out of these kind of things saying kumbaya. Right. You know what I'm saying? And it's not that's that's right. that's not the goal. No, it is not. That's it not never has been. Sort of, not in but, this society. But, yes. but the goal is is that let's let's have the conversation. Okay. Let's have the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think no better example could be put before us than something we saw this past weekend, uh, the funeral of, of, of Senator John McCain. Yes. Two, two of his fiercest rivals, Barack Obama mm -hmm. and George W. Bush. Were present. They were present. But more importantly, they showed us how to behave. Mm -hmm. That, okay, we can disagree, but there comes a time when disagreement is gone, the lot has been cast, let's come and make peace with each other and move on. Sure. Dwell, uh, dwelling in old stuff does not help anybody. Right. Let's, let's come to a consensus that the die has been cast, the numbers are in, move on. We have to. Let's move on. We, we have to. Uh, yeah, that's, we'll have to have you come back on the civility piece and how that is <laughs> <laughs> terribly lacking. Um, and, and it's always probably been, um, not probably, has been an, an issue uh, throughout this society. Uh, it seems to have been heightened um, uh, last couple years, or we won't even get into the politics of this mm -hmm. administration because that's not why we're, we're mm -hmm. here. Um, and I, I don't want to... Um, belabor the moment with that. But yes, the need is, is so significant and, and so profound, teaching those lessons. Well, you know, one of the purposes when, when the board gave me permission to start this Black History concert mm -hmm. was the whole notion, well, two things I know about South Georgia, good food and good music will bring people together yes. regardless. It, it tends to trans, transcend race and it gender. Does. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, when these young folk came from the different schools, 
and sat and sang together. The music they were making wasn't Dorita High music or Albany mm -hmm. High music or Dilfield music or Sherwood music. It was music. Mm -hmm. And you did not know unless you knew that they were from different schools. Sure, represented, yeah. And, and the point was, when you get folk focused on a common goal, it lessens that opportunity to start looking at each other. They're looking at a common goal yes. and achieving things. And when they made that music, and, and the fact was, we were practicing one day at Shallow Church. One of my church members then came in and asked, uh, Deacon Wilson, what choir is that? Mm. And I'll go, aha, if you didn't hear but one choir, Right. The goal has goal. been achieved, there you go. that, Mission that was the goal. Mission accomplished, yes. Outstanding, outstanding. Yeah. So that is just um, uh, in, um, an example of one of the many things that you do um, at the Institute and serving in that role. What, uh, what's the experience um, that you desire for one walking through the door, whether it be a community night, whether it be just coming to take a tour? What can a visitor uh, prepare to receive? I expect the visitors to the Civil Rights Institute to come out with a better understanding, A, of this community, of the transition. No community can go through what Albany went through and remain the same. Yes. No person should come through the Civil Rights Institute and be exposed to what we have there and come out the same. Mm. It should be life changing their awareness should be heightened and an appreciation for those folk who put their lives on the line for this community, for this nation in yes. many ways. Um, I, I think that there has been a disservice in many ways to uh, some of those folk who were here in Albany and across the nation. Uh, and I said disservice, why? Because when we don't register and vote, when we don't, when we don't get educated about who's running for office, it all, it's almost like a disservice to those folks who put their lives, put their blood on the line for us. So I would like for folks to come through that at the Civil Rights Institute and become more informed, more educated, more aware, more enthused, and have a deeper appreciation. I always say this, uh, I'm the ultimate optimist, that I think that the more young folk come through and realize uh, the pride they ought to have of being from Albany. Indeed. Instead of running from Albany to embrace Albany because yeah. uh, without Albany, a lot of other civil rights uh, marches and protests and sure. could not have Wouldn't been have possible. Occurred. Right. Certainly that would not have been a Birmingham mm -hmm. without an Albany. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are those who will say, well, the Albany movement was a failure. How can you be a failure when you impacted sure. so many other cities. How can be, you be a failure when every one of your elected uh, boards in your community looks differently now than it did before? Indeed. Indeed. And so uh, maybe I just don't understand failure. If that's a failure, then I would like to have more failures in our community. I agree if with you. Move us I to agree a different with you. Level. Yeah, it's important not to di dismiss the influence. And yes. Although we we may envisioned it um, having a different outcome. Yes. Um, the outcome, as you uh, said earlier, still occurred, and it still uh, played a huge part in what then followed afterwards. Whether it be in Albany, whether it be in Detroit, whether it be in Chicago, whether it be in Montgomery, it still had um, an influence uh, in, in some form or fashion. Well, see, I think that the thing that often happens, there are those who want to attach the success of the Albany movement to the successes of Dr. Martin Luther yes. King. And while I take nothing from Dr. Martin Luther King, we have to understand that folk in Albany were already on the ground in that movement when he came to town. It happened, yeah. He came to town and raised the awareness mm -hmm. because the national press picked up this local story. Yes. Prior to his coming, it was a local story. When King came to town, it became a national and international story. So the successes of the movement had nothing at all to do with the successes of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I have nothing but the utmost respect for him, but I think it's important that we keep history 
uh, imbalance. I agree. And the truth be told. I agree. Yeah, it's it's what, how um, if in fact the spotlight occurred and at what point did it occur? Um, and so when it received attention does not mean that it was not um, occurring yes. uh, prior to that time. You reminded me of a conversation that I had with Coretta Scott King. I was probably about oh, 19, 18 or 19, and I just started um, probably a little bit younger than that because I was at Southern University at the time, and she was kind of chastising the institution uh, because of the lack of involvement from her perspective as it relates to speaking out against the apartheid movement. Mm -hmm. and, and so I um, very uh, kindly and respectfully uh, challenged her and disagreed, and I said it, it's not that it has not, that we have not uh, try to wa raise awareness about apartheid. It's just that the media hadn't descended upon the campus yet. Mm -hmm. And so at that particular time, all the PWIs were getting a lot of the attention and the HBCUs were not. So to the point, to your point that you made earlier, know that people were, there were, um, you know, feet on the ground, if you, or boots on the ground, if you will, trying to bring attention to the cause at that particular time. Mm -hmm. It's just, again, it was local. It was local. And then when it became national is when it, it received it, greater attention. Greater attention. Because um, uh, the Criterion Club, the Lincoln House Society, um, and uh, other individuals in this community had long raised the awareness of the inequities here yes. in Albany, Georgia. And and so I, I, I certainly don't want, I don't want the story ever to be <laughs> uh, mistaken that folk in Albany did not put themselves out there. Sure. Now there was a, a, a line attributed to uh, Dr. King that said, when the people in Albany decide to straighten their backs up, things begin to move. As long as they were bent over, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, people can ride your back. Right. See, we have to understand that there are two songs that we sing in church. Uh, when the roll is called up young, I'll be there, and don't call the roll until I get there. And mm -hmm. we have to decide which one of those we're going to be a part of. Are we going to be there when the roll is called? Are we going to ask folk to hold on, let me get there? And I think people in Albany decide when the roll is called up, y'all I want to be there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we've continued to move in that direction. That's and that's, that's the direction that this whole community uh, has to move as we begin to address change. And thank you for bringing attention to that comment because I, um, un I, I believe that Albany has unfairly that statement that was made by King. Um, we've had to uh, bear that um, and not looking at the full context that he used that as an example because it was a recent experience. But that um, uh, piece about not riding your people cannot ride your back um, as long as you're not in that position. Mm -hmm. um, that's applicable to people in Houston, Timbuktu, yeah, so wherever you are, yes. um, that is a behavior that you need to be mindful of. And then what, if you are um, uh, displaying that behavior and acting that behavior, then once you make that correction, then you will see a change. You will, you will be met with some resistance along the way. But I, I think it's been unfairly applied to that it was, you know, oh, that, that Albany, Georgia. And that was across the, yeah, that's part of the, that was whole part of the conditioning of slavery. Well, that too, and it's, it, it, it's part and parcel of that other statement. You have to teach people how to treat you. Yes, yes. People will treat you the way you allow them to do. I would agree. And so when you stop letting people treat you a certain way, uh, they will stop, but as long nobody gives up power voluntarily. Yes. Nobody yes. gives up power voluntarily, yes. and it, it's sad commentary. But all of the gains by the African American American community has come through protest. Sure. Nobody ever opened the door and said, "Hello." I know. Welcome. Come, come, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> come to the table of equity yeah. and it, yeah yeah you are absolutely right yeah there was always some resistance yes and yes and then once we require acquired it 
I was um, in, in some in small forms because it is still a pursuit uh, reminded of um, Dr. John Henry Clark uh, because we are then sometimes very critical of one another because mm -hmm. you have the power and why are you not exercising it properly? Well, power needs a rehearsal. It does. And, and if you have not had it um, or been provided an education in its u proper uses and management of it, um, then that has its own set of problems. So there is a saying: If you deny my existence, then expect my resistance. resistance. Absolutely, absolutely, so true. Tell us what we can expect. Uh, it's the fall, and so that's the commencement of, of many things. And so I know you have a slate of activities that I know you're planning. <laughs> uh, well, well, well. On September, well, I guess in order, on September 15th, we're partnering with Albany State University the first football game to recognize the Civil Rights Institute. Uh, Rutha Harris and the Freedom Singers will uh, sing the national anthem. Uh, members of the board will flip the coin and hold the flag and so, and we will, ha we will have a donation table out front. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, and then on the 19th, uh, that will be the commemoration march and lead reef laying in Camilla, Georgia, mm. um, around the Camilla Massacre. And uh, our community night this month, we have a one-woman play featuring Betty Von Sweat in a one-woman play, and she will, she will uh, play four characters, uh, Arthurine Lucy, Rosa Parks, Claire Brown, and Sojourner Truth. Wow. That's going to be on September the 27th okay. uh, at, at the Institute. And so we're excited about uh, the month of September. Some good stuff going on at the Institute. Well, now, see, you're, you're not fair to the other organizations in the community. Let me tell you why. Because you rattle off four major activities all occurring in one month. And some organizations do that throughout the span of an entire year. So now they've got to, you have raised the bar. Uh, but again, um, and, and I say that jokingly, but I, I also applaud you uh, because this has to be very intentional and we cannot miss an opportunity to, to educate. I was reminded, um, I caught pieces of the um, uh, Aretha Franklin um, funeral uh, and the celebration of her life. And that's what a lot of the presenters did. Of course, it was to you know, eulogize her mm -hmm. and celebrate her accomplishments. Uh, many of them were rooted in the advancement uh, of, of people and, and certainly civil rights, but they, they took advantage of the moment to, to educate. Um, and so sometimes we look at that, ah, is this the appropriate time? And it is always an appropriate time to enlighten. And of course there's decorum, uh, but we cannot miss an opportunity because these, these changes are happening in real time. And so again, it should it should never cease. And so that's what you provide an example of. Well, change has to be deliberate. Yes, <laughs> it, yes. it has to be deliberate. Yes. And so, uh, yeah, I, I thank you, uh, but we do try to find every opportunity that we can to put the Civil Rights Institute on display, mm -hmm. but more importantly, educate sure. in the community through different forums, whether it's jazz music, whether it's a play, whether yeah. it's a debate, uh, whether it's a lecture. I think getting folk into the Civil Rights Institute is the ultimate goal that the board has given me and that I take it very proudly. We, 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 we honor you and we, are, we applaud you. I have the honor of serving on that board and so I, I continue to be amazed about what you are able to do on a daily basis um, and keeping the Institute in the forefront. Uh, still find time for your beloved alma mater and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, your president always reminds me of that. You know, he is a Fort Valley alum, so <laughs> don't, you know, like, I, I know, I know he is. Um, before we wrap up, this is a very selfish question because I, um, of course, everybody knows that I'm an avid reader and I would love to know what book outside of your preferred religious text, I have to put that out there, um, was transforming in your life after you read it? Hmm. I, one that I read recently mm -hmm. was called First in His Class, and it was the life story of Bill Clinton mm. and, and how his visit to the White House uh, as a teenager, and I'm trying to remember, it may have been FFA 4-H or whatever it was that took him to the White House to, uh, to meet John Kennedy. And it was at that point that he made a decision 
that that's that's that that's what I'm gonna be one day, mm. President of the United States. And what it did for me is to just allow my allow me to understand <clears throat> more about me. I never had the experience of meeting John Kennedy. But sometimes when you set your eye on a goal, don't be deterred from it, regardless of the obstacles and the yeah. dots and the arrows and and the naysayers, yes. more importantly, All that is the naysayers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, as my Cajun friend would say, uh, "How'd you get that deal? Just go out and <laughs> <laughs> just, just go out, do just it. go out and do it." You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Wow. Okay, I'll have to, I'll have to pick that up. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, we need to have you back. Uh, get you on a, here on a regular uh, basis. But let me, on behalf of the board, on behalf of Albany State, and on behalf of the I could, you know, so many different factions and organizations uh, that uh, I'm directly or indirectly connected to uh, that I want to say thanks on their behalf. I know this is not an easy um, role that you have but uh, you make it look easy. And I know that that is rooted in your love and passion um, for um, uh, civil opportunity, civil rights for all, because it does. It transcends gender, it transcends race, religion. We've seen that play out throughout history. And so you are a shining um, example of that. And so um, again, uh, continued, um, um, strength and uh, peace of mind and encouragement to continue that path because I do know that it is very uh, you have full context in terms of um, experiences that you've probably had yourself uh, family members uh, you look at it through so many different uh, lenses uh, and so that desire is strengthened for people to embrace this wealth of knowledge that this community uh, has to provide. And so when we don't, you know, grab at it uh, with thirst and hunger, I know that that can be frustrating for you because you're, you're human. Well, you know, I always think about uh, a couple of things and it's simply this, that um, I have grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And if, if I can make the world just a little bit better for them, then my living would not have been in vain. I love that. That's a perfect uh, note to end on. But before we end, tell the viewers uh, the location of the Institute, what we're, the hours of operation <laughs> are, the important we're, stuff. We're, <laughs> we're located at 326 Whitney Avenue. Okay. And we're open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. Okay. And the Freedom Singers are there every second Saturday from one to three. Outstanding, an amazing treat. Frank Wilson, thank you so much thank for all you that so you much. do for this community. Come back any, any time you'd like. Thank you. Viewers, thank you so much for joining me for this edition of Realizing Potential. I'm Wendy Wilson and I will see you next time.